Good evening. This is this is the March 2023 gathering of the Historical Society of Frankfurt. My name is John Buffington. We do this eight times a year. I'm the programmer. And when we screw up with either either scheduling or uh, uh, producing the uh, publicity on these events, uh, the, the, the buck stops with me. I screwed up this month. We didn't communicate very well with, I didn't communicate very well with the uh, speaker that I had in mind that, it, that I had scheduled well in advance. I apologize to all concerned. This month, our friends at Pensbury Manor, which is a state historical museum, have generously provided us with an emergency fill-in speaker who fortunately knows the material that the uh, original speaker was intended to, uh, to deliver. Uh, Zachary, Long, Zachary, sorry, Zachary Long is going to talk about the beginning of Pennsylvania. And I'm sorry, I never met the man before tonight. He never saw me before tonight. We're, we're still uh, getting adjusted to this. Um, but uh, I appreciate your being here tonight. Thank you very much. Um, and we're going to uh, do the best we can to uh, produce something that's going to be worth remembering and 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 staying up on the on the internet i think even though our even though our uh, uh, audience is going to be small because we didn't get the publicity out right or i didn't get the publicity out right we're gonna we're gonna uh, put it up and and i think i'm gonna refer people back to it from time to time i think because this is going to be very important. I think that what we're talking about tonight is the beginning of not just Pennsylvania, but the whole idea of tolerance in America. I think America was founded not to be a Roman Catholic nation, because the first people that got here, first Christians that, are, that arrived and started, first Europeans who were Christians, uh, were Roman Catholics. And they, they were in the business of, of, of converting local people to Roman Catholicism. They enslaved them. Um, then there were um, the, the first English-speaking uh, arrivals in Jamestown were Anglicans, and they may very well have thought that they were founding an Anglican nation, and, they, and it was for a while uh, an Anglican colony. We were still imprisoning, I'm a Virginian, we were still imprisoning Baptist missionaries when Thomas Jefferson was governor and talked the General Assembly into, in Virginia into uh, passing uh, legislation uh, called the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, which was one of his favorite accomplishments. Uh, that's well after William Penn. William Penn, it seems to me, as an, as a, an exiled uh, Virginian, uh, it seems to me that William Penn laid the cornerstone for American tolerance, and that's one of the most crucial things that makes us who we are today. Not being a Christian nation, being a tolerant nation. So... With that, my guest is going to uh, talk about that stuff. Thank you very much, and welcome, sir. Thank you very much, John. Yeah. 
<clears throat> well, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, and as John said, we uh, apologize for not getting some stuff out a little sooner. Um, between everybody involved, we, we dropped the ball, but I, hopefully uh, this will be, as John said, something worth remembering. And uh, again, thank you for coming. Um, as, as John alluded to, uh, I'm going to be talking about the chartering of Pennsylvania. The chartering of Pennsylvania um, really lays the groundwork for uh, everything that happens uh, in Pennsylvania after um, March 4th, 1681. Uh, when William Penn receives the, the charter for Pennsylvania from Charles II. Um, there was a lot of uh, work that had to be done ahead of time, a lot of work that was done by William Penn's father um, before you know, William Penn was born and, and while he was growing up. Uh, so without any further delay, let's, uh, let's dive in here. So a little bit about William Penn. Uh, we could spend an entire evening talking about William Penn the person. Um, so this uh, section just has some of the highlights that I think are important to, to this chartering of Pennsylvania. William Penn is born October 14th, 1644. He is born into a time of extreme religious turmoil. He lives through extreme religious turmoil in Great Britain. Uh, the persecution of anybody who is not uh, Anglican is, is quite heavy during William Penn's lifetime um, uh, and lives until um, 1718. So he sees quite a large uh, swath of time and a lot of changes are happening in Great Britain and here um, in the American colonies. Um, he's often known as a Quaker. Uh, he's often known as a governor. He's a founder, uh, politician, and a diplomat. He's uh, working with the Lenape here in uh, Pennsylvania. He's working with the Swedes. He's working with the Dutch. He's working with the Finns. He's working with German settlers. Um, and their, their constituents back in, in Europe, so very much a, a diplomat uh, in his own right. But he, uh, he joins the Society of Friends, what we know as Quakers, uh, in 1667 um, as, a, as a teenager, as a young man. Uh, and at this point, William Penn's father, uh, Admiral Sir William Penn, pretty much disowns his son. Uh, to be a Quaker uh, is the worst thing that you could possibly do. <laughs> Um, to, to somebody of, of William Penn's father standing. Um, William Penn had a promising future uh, as a quarter uh, on, the, on the courts of, of um, Charles II, James II later. Um, could have gone very, very far in the English Navy had he choose to follow his father's footsteps. Could have done a lot of great things, uh, but all of that ceased uh, as a possibility when he became a Quaker, when he converted to the Quaker faith. Um, Right before William Penn's father dies in 1670, the two kind of kind of make up. Um, leading up to his father's death, there's an understanding uh, that it's not this, I'm destroying your life, dad, I'm sorry. I think a lot of us have had this moment in our lives with our parents, we're not, we're not doing things to upset you. Uh, and I think they finally kind of had that agreement right before William Penn's father died. Um, but Admiral Sir William Penn dies in 1760, and the family credit uh, that was accrued during William Penn's father's lifetime passes to the eldest son, um, William Penn, R. William Penn. Um, flash forward to 1680, uh, Charles II agrees to grant William Penn land in North America. Now the land that Charles II is granting um, belongs to his brother, uh, James, the Duke of York, who we know then will later become James II, King of Great Britain. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about James II's relationship with William Penn as we continue through this presentation, but that is somewhat important to know that James II is willingly giving land that he owns here in America to a Quaker. Um, all right. So why a colony? Um, why is William Penn getting a colony from the English government? At this point, the English government is trying to restrict colonies here in North America. Um, the Lord of Trade Parliament is attempting to kind of walk back some of these earlier charters that were given um, to, to, to say the Puritans um, up in, in Massachusetts. Uh, they're working to rein in uh, the Virginians with their charter. Uh, as it was written, they're working to kind of also reign in or the Calverts to some extent, but the Calverts, their charter was so very liberal when it was written, it's almost impossible to bring them kind of together uh, in line with, with the rest of, of Great Britain. So um, 
one of the reasons that he could have could have gotten this land uh, was to repay that that debt that was occurred uh, by the king during his exile, um, during the English Civil War, and then after, prior to the Restoration, um, to help the king get rid of some of these pesky people that we have in in Great Britain, some of these Quakers that are that are causing so much issue. That's one of the reasons that we might give him a colony. Uh, a colony would allow both financial gain and freedom of worship. Uh, for the Quakers, for the dissenters, for the ranters, for all these people uh, that are doing us a, a great disservice. And it also allows William Penn to make some money. Um, William Penn, after his father dies, not only gets the credit uh, for the debt, but also gets uh, Sir Admiral William Penn's holdings in Great Britain and Ireland. Uh, William Penn is, as I often say while I'm at Pensbury, William Penn is not a phenomenally good uh, manager of estates. He doesn't um, collect taxes very easily, people default on, on credit to William Penn fairly easily. Uh, so he's running into uh, some financial problems uh, at this point when he goes to Charles II and say, hey, can I have some land here in, in North America? Um, and really, we have to kind of to finish piecing together this map. Um, Great Britain has uh, colonies up in what is New England. Great Britain has colonies in what is, is you know, Southern uh, America today, Virginia, uh, South Carolina, Georgia, places like that. Uh, and there's kind of this hole in the middle of, of, of the, the colonies at this point. We have East and West Jersey, as we see here on the map. Um, but uh, really kind of what is Pennsylvania is part of the Duke of York's estate uh, up in, in, the, in the New York region, in the New Amsterdam region. So we have to kind of uh, pull all of this together. Um, and that's, that's one of the other reasons that we might give William Penn a, a colony here. Okay, uh, so honoring Admiral Penn, the first reason that we said is to, to kind of get that credit paid back to the Penn family. Um, William Penn's father originally uh, helped with the removal of the monarchy, of the Stuart monarchy, uh, with the, the roundheads in the parliament uh, after Charles I decides to, to call an end to parliament uh, and to run England the way he wants to. Uh, so. Directly or indirectly, um, Admiral Penn or, or William Penn's father um, removes the, the monarchy from Great Britain. Um, during his time, he sits on, on several ships for the, uh, for the new uh, Great Britain, for the Commonwealth. Um, he fights in the Irish seas. He goes over and is part of the Mediterranean um, battles for the English to get some of those sugar islands that are down there. He is part of the great debacle, uh, which will give the English um, Jamaica. That was not the original intention, was to capture Jamaica at that point. Uh, we were looking for some of the other sugar islands. We got a little turned around. We decided uh, during a storm that the Jamaica, that we didn't know was the island at the time, would be a good place to, to kind of to hold a battle. Uh, Admiral Penn realizes his great mistake uh, for taking Jamaica, uh, gets the army back on the ship, goes back to Great Britain, and uh, is promptly imprisoned in the Tower of London by Oliver Cromwell for a period of time because of this debacle. Um, but during this time, even under the, uh, this, this Cromwellian head, uh, Admiral William Penn seems to be in connections with loyalists, with, with sympathizers to the, to the monarchy. Um, and uh, Admiral Penn uh, positions himself on uh, the Royal Charles uh, that is sent up to grab Charles II uh, from his exile in Holland after we realize that Oliver Cromwell's son is just not going to do the job. Um, and we throw the, the Cromwells out uh, and we reinstart, uh, reinstall, excuse me, um, this Stuart line with Charles II being that first monarch that we, we put back on the throne. But that is, uh, is very interesting uh, that, that he positions himself on that ship because uh, as we see, he's kind of playing this fine line uh, of being uh, a roundhead and, and being a loyalist, and, and where is he going to land? And obviously he lands with the, uh, with the loyalists. Uh, he's funding, at this point, the English, this navy, with food uh, and supplies as needed. Uh, he's at several battles that help uh, expand English territories. Uh, the Battle of Lostoff, uh, which, which really kind of progresses uh, the first Anglo-Dutch War uh, and brings that to kind of a close there. Um, but let, let's look at him. Uh, he's extremely talented as a seaman and a commander, um, well-connected. He knows Charles II. He knows who will become James II. He knows um, all these people in Parliament. He sits in Parliament for a while. So he's very well-connected, William Penn's father. And he's modest to a fault. Um, 
when Charles II uh, is reestablished as head of the English Empire, um, Charles II grants the Duke of York uh, high admiralty. He is in charge of, of the English Navy. And uh, during these battles of Lostoff and other battles during the, the Anglo-Dutch Wars, William Penn, Admiral Penn, gives credit to the Duke of York and takes responsibility for all major failures. The monarchy is always looking good with Admiral William Penn. Uh, and, and I think the monarchy knows that. They, they know that he's helping them create this very nice face for the, for the English people. And I think all of these things combined are going to, to help uh, give William Penn uh, this upper hand when he goes to the king and says, let me have some land here. Let me, let me do some good here. Um, the other thing that we have to talk about, and we've been kind of, of hinting around here, is it's all about who you know. William Penn and Sir Admiral William Penn know Charles II and know James, Duke of York. Okay, Admiral Penn assists in the restoration of the monarchy in uh, 1660. Okay, that's going to get him major points. Uh, the Penn family helps fund the Navy. We talked about that. Um, the Penn family uh, is openly received at the courts of Charles II. That's a good thing. You're, you're constantly in the king's presence when you're, when you're at his court. Um, William Penn, R. William Penn, um, writes this lovely Latin uh, eulogy uh, for uh, the king's younger brother who passes away. Uh, and it's it's read at court, and apparently James and uh, Charles love it. They 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 say it's the best thing that they they've heard for this this eulogy for their for their brother. Uh, just kind of kind of cool, kind of interesting. Um, during Penn's time in the military, this is again our our William Penn. Everybody thinks of of William Penn as a Quaker and a pacifist. As a young child before converting to Quakerism, he did spend time like most um, good nobles uh, in the military. Uh, and he becomes steadfast friends with James II. This friendship will continue uh, as James ascends to the throne uh, of England after the death of his brother. Um, the Penn family is at the coronation. Admiral Penn is actually in the Abbey. He's playing an active part in the coronation of Charles II. So that, again, is a, is a very good thing. Um, and during the Anglo-Dutch War, as we said, um, William spends time um, as a page uh, for the Admiral and is in the courts of Charles II. So they're constantly in this face of the monarchy, and that's that's going to help him later. The other reason that we might want to give uh, William Penn a charter uh, is all these pesky people that we see um, in England at the time, and, and we're going to put pesky in quotations. Uh, okay. So upon the restoration of the monarchy, uh, religious persecution begins uh, again uh, within Great Britain. Uh, English separatist groups, uh, such as the Puritans, we all know the Puritans, they're up in New England. Um, ranters, seekers, Baptists, uh, Anabaptists, uh, all become the target again of, of persecution in Great Britain. Uh, the Quakers, or the, the Society of Friends, is also part of this group uh, of people that is being persecuted. Um, but uh, at William Penn's time, the Quakers have spread out of Great Britain uh, and into other countries in Europe, um, which is something most people don't think about. We have German Quakers, we have Dutch Quakers up in Holland, we have French Quakers, uh, we have Irish Quakers, uh, Scottish Quakers, things like that. Um, and what's interesting about the Quakers is that they, they take the abuse, they take the persecution, uh, and they stay where they are. They're not fleeing, they're not leaving um, like other groups. Um, and that's kind of a thorn in the side of the king and the parliament. Uh, is that they can't get rid of this group. Uh, and as, as a prominent Quaker, William Penn can kind of offer this, I can remove this problem um, that you seem to be having. Um, now, as we're going to find out later, it is not a mass exodus of Quakers out of England. Quakers will stay in England after William Penn gets his colony. Um, but we do start to see kind of this trickle migration of Quakers um, out of England and some of these other areas um, in Europe into the, uh, the colony that William Penn founds. So, I apologize for the wall of text. <laughs> Once we get to the negotiating the charter, it becomes formal, it becomes legal, it becomes long, okay? Um, so, when you go to, to get this charter, you first petition the king uh, 
can I have a charter? Are you agreeable to giving me this charter or this land? Okay, so William Penn uh, presents a request to Charles II for this colony. Uh, once Charles approves this request, uh, it is sent to a committee uh, who then ask neighboring proprietors, neighboring uh, colonies, are we okay with inserting this colony here? Okay, who are these neighbors? The Duke of York uh, will become a neighbor, but he owns, as I said earlier, all of that land that will make up Pennsylvania, New York. So they go to Duke of York saying, can we have some of this land? Uh, they also go to Charles Calvert, uh, who owns uh, Maryland at the time, the Calvert family, the proprietors of, of Maryland, uh, and say, can we insert this colony above you? Uh, once we kind of get the agreement that this is okay all the way around, uh, we can begin drafting this charter. Okay, William Penn presents the first draft of the charter, uh, and he relies heavily on the charter uh, originally drafted for, for the Calverts for Maryland. Um, he wants kind of this big open book. If we look at the, the, the charter for Maryland, it's very, very liberal in the way uh, it's allowing the Calvert family to, to run the colony. And William Penn is hoping for that kind of broad, overreaching charter. Um, he unfortunately doesn't get it. Uh, the Lord of Trade, uh, the King of Great Britain, uh, begins to edit and review. Uh, at this point, we get restrictions. Um, authorities are granted to the pens. Privileges are granted to the pens. Caveats are put into the, the charter. Uh, so we start striking things, adding things, tweaking things uh, in the original draft. Um, drafts continue to be to be written. Um, I have high resolution photos a little bit later of the final charter, and I want you to understand that each time a draft is presented, it has to be written. Um, and the, the, the charter ends up being four pages. So we're constantly striking, rewriting, striking, rewriting these charters as we go along. Uh, and everybody kind of has copies. Lord of North uh, for the parliament has a copy. William Penn and his team have a copy. Uh, the king has a copy in, in, in his parliament. They just keep rewriting these charters uh, during this time. Uh, once the final charter is written, at this point, uh, we get Pennsylvania inserted for the first time in the second to final charter, I believe. Okay. Um, Pennsylvania, as you notice, is spelled incorrectly. Uh, this is how it was originally written in the charter. Um, Penn wants to, to, uh, to call his colony Slovenia. Um, for anybody who takes Latin, woods, forest, tree stand, collection of trees, anything. Okay, Slovenia. Uh, the king inserts the pen, uh, and most people claim that it is not William Penn it is being named after, it is being named after Admiral Sir William Penn uh, because of all of the, the generous deeds that have been um, done in his name uh, during his lifetime. Okay, so we get Pennsylvania slapped in there. Uh, we make kind of final tweaks. Uh, this charter then is sent to the Privy Council where it will begin that final process of getting that great seal or the king's signature, okay? Uh, all of this happens in somewhat um, of a short time. Uh, as I said, uh, William Penn's original charter wanted kind of more of that Maryland style. Um, he unfortunately gets kind of this half Maryland hybrid um, that we have. Uh, and there are, are, are a few caveats, as you can see here. William Penn can erect forts uh, in his new colony. Um, titles and honors cannot be confirmed in his name, so he can't create a duke, a lord, a duchess, anything like that here in, in, in North America, can't do that. Um, he cannot pardon murder or treason, which is something that the Calverts could do. Um, so you do get some of these people fleeing uh, from other colonies or freeing from England and going to Maryland because of this kind of pardon system that they do have. Um, as proprietor, he is obligated to enforce the Navigation Act. As we go forward in time into the 18th century, these Navigation Acts are going to become a problem for most colonies and will lead to, to other issues later. But William Penn is forced to, to honor these Navigation Acts. Um, he has to admit uh, customs officers into the Providence. Uh, so these are royal customs officers um, that are, are forced to be allowed in. Uh, laws are subject to royal review. He will use this to his uh, effect later. Uh, it's a five-year review process. As it turns out, uh, Parliament uh, has a backlog of laws that it has to review, shocker. Um, and uh, the William Penn will take advantage of this and will tweak laws every 
4.9 years and the review process has to start again so he can live with his own laws here in the colonies and kind of do kind of what he wants, which is kind of cool. Um, and parliament can impose custom duties without consent. Okay, so, so laws and customs can be, can be imported here without William Penn's consent um, or the assembly's consent. Okay, kind of interesting with that one um, that again, we don't see in the Maryland Charter. <sighs> again, I apologize. <laughs> Wall of text. Uh, a breakdown of the charter, uh, it is 23 separate sections within this charter. Um, the, the flowery introduction um, allows William Penn to work with the, the native people here to, to, as it says, civilize and Christianize these people. Um, but the, the language is flowery and William Penn as a Quaker is gonna do very nice things with the Lenape uh, as he comes over here. Uh, his children on the other hand will, will, will not. Um, each section then uh, has specific aspects of the colony in mind as it's being written. The first um, uh, sets our boundaries. I'm not gonna go through all these, the big ones like the boundaries, we have to understand where Pennsylvania lies. Uh, Pennsylvania's Eastern boundary is the Delaware River. Uh, a Western boundary is hairy, not necessarily established because in theory this just continues uh, across. Um, New York is going to be kind of our northern border, that, that relatively modern New York, Pennsylvania border uh, is where the Duke of York sets himself up. Um, southern border is hairy, very hairy. Um, there will be battles with the Calvert family and the Penn family uh, until the 1730s, 1740s over this, this land boundary of where that southernmost border is. Um, second section is land, water, and mineral rights, what William Penn has as far as this is concerned. Uh, mineral rights also what um, precious metals and what portion of them are obligated to go back to the monarchy. If he finds gold here by some miracle, a portion of that is the king's and is obligated. If he finds silver here by some miracle, it's obligated to go back to the king in some portion. Um, kind of, you can read through this, uh, absolute authority is granted to Penn. Uh, that's kind of cool. That allows him to do pretty much whatever he wants. He has to set up a legislature. He has to set up a court, but kind of how he does that is his own um, purview. Um, it encourages him to make laws that he sees fit, uh, appoints officials, erect courts, as I said. Um, as I said here, and you can see, uh, requires laws to be reviewed every five years. We know that William Penn is going to take advantage of that uh, with that you know, 4.9 year uh, law stint. Um, create towns, cities, countries, counties, et cetera, uh, here in, in Pennsylvania. Um, Pennsylvania goods must be sent to England. We can't just send to, say, France. Uh, all goods from Pennsylvania have to be exported back to the mother country and from the mother country are then able to be exported out. Okay, we can live with that, uh, at least for the time being. He's encouraged to create ports and allow customs officers uh, into the country, as I said. Uh, he can create some of his own custom duties uh, on top of whatever parliament decides to throw on top. Um, he's forced to, as I said, have agent, uh, has an agent in London. Um, this agent in London is going to take the brunt of any wrongdoing that William Penn does here in the colony. So you don't want to be that agent in London because he's going to be the one called in front of Parliament and say, what the heck is William Penn doing? Um, forbids doing business with countries that are at war with Great Britain, obvious. Um, he can raise a militia as a Quaker. He doesn't do that, and that will become a problem later. Um, allows Penn to sell and rent land here in the colony. Um, kind of a duh, but that one was necessary. Um, purchase and dispose of land as agreed upon by the proprietor. So that's if you buy land in Pennsylvania, you can sell it, you can rent it, you can do what you want as long as the proprietor says it's okay. Um, the king will not levy taxes or customs. That's obviously something that we know is a lie, uh, but is written in there later. Um, the king, um, king officials must abide by the charter. Uh, that's kind of an important one. Um, and this is interesting. 20 Anglicans, if we have 20 Anglicans here in the city of Philadelphia, which we know obviously will eventually become a problem, um, problem again in quotes, um, William Penn is required to send a letter to uh, the bishop in London and they will send a priest or a preacher here to, to Philadelphia to preach to the Anglican uh, congregation here. Um, and a procedure is put in place for when questions arise. I think that's kind of cool. The last section of this is, okay, we know problems are gonna arise. We know issues are gonna come up. 
there's a section in this to say who you go to to get these questions sorted out. I like that. Uh, I think it's kind of fun. So we have here the first uh, page of the four-page charter. Um, it's illegible. Um, even kind of when you're up on top of it, you have to really get that magnifying glass out and read through it very finely. Um, but what's interesting about this is we have an illustration of Charles II up in the upper corner. Um, and around the outside, up at the top, we have the lion and the unicorn, symbolizing Great Britain and Scotland. That's up at the top there, right in the center. It's a little clearer as we go through. Um, you can see the harp on the lower uh, corner there. That would be uh, Great or uh, Ireland, excuse me. Uh, Great Britain with your three lions. Um, there is the Florida Lee down in the lower corner. That would be Brittany. So just kind of. Um, making everybody aware that the king is is uh, in control of all of these regions and that the king ultimately has control over the land that he's giving or gifting to William Penn and that that's you know um, important to remember here. So we've got our first page. Um, this was damaged uh, fairly extensively uh, the charter while it was here in in Pennsylvania um, in the 19th and 20th century. So that's what the water stain there and the deterioration at the bottom that that's what that is. Uh, on that cover page. Uh, we have the second, which is a little clearer. This is a better image. Uh, again, you can see the harps, the thistle, the, um, the rose, um, all that good stuff. Um, again, third page here. Uh, again, water damage to this third page, uh, right in the center there, right where that crease was in the first page. Um, and then this last page, again, a giant watermark here. This one's a little bit darker. Um, but that's, that's what we have there. But the, that was the charter. So that is the charter that William Penn received from Charles II uh, and was brought over here and is in the state archives in Harrisburg. Um, kind of a little commercial plug um, for the PHMC or the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission. Um, every March, the second Sunday of the month, uh, state sites like Pensbury, uh, Landis Valley Village and Farm Museum, Ephrata Cloister, um, uh, the State Museum in Harrisburg and the archives uh, celebrate what we call Charter Day or Pennsylvania's birthday. Um, if you go to the State Archives, unfortunately not this year uh, because the State Archives are moving, they actually bring out the Charter uh, and allow you to kind of get up close and personal with it. Um, next year, uh, I believe the archives will hopefully be moved, knock on wood. Um, please make that, that journey out to Harrisburg and, and see our Charter uh, on display out at the State Archives. So the Great Seal is, is placed uh, on the charter. It is taken to William Penn. William Penn has his new colony. Uh, and you can see that image there. That is the, the Great Seal or a copy of the Great Seal that was placed on the outside of that charter uh, for William Penn. All things considered, it was a relatively quick process, uh, only about 10 months from the time um, Charles II uh, agrees to give land to William Penn to that final Great Seal being confirmed. Uh, so relatively quick. Uh, under this charter, William Penn uh, can practice political and religious liberty, um, which is interesting. Uh, he has been trying in Great Britain for a long time to pass laws and to have Parliament pass laws uh, that will allow for more religious toleration. He becomes disillusioned, which I think is one of the reasons that he goes to Charles and says, can I have this land? Let me um, create this kind of colony that, that will allow for this religious toleration. Um, but this happens, as I said, on March 4th, 1681, um, he gets that, um, that charter and he becomes one of the largest landholders when he receives this charter, 45,000 square miles of land in North America. Okay. Um, very, very large chunk of, of property that William Penn now has that he has to try and figure out how to make money off of. And if we remember from earlier in the conversation, William Penn is not phenomenally good with small estates and making money. Um, how is he going to do with making money on the larger uh, Pennsylvania colony? Um, after receiving his, his charter, he writes to James Harrison, who will become the steward of Pensbury Manor, uh, and Pensbury Manor is the summer home of William Penn here in, in Pennsylvania. He writes to him uh, and says, I have obtained it, uh, referring to the charter, uh, and desire that I may be worthy of his love, um, God's love, uh, but do that which may answer his kind province and answer uh, his truth uh, and people, referring to Quakers, all religious dissenters, anybody who, who 
uh, will come to Pennsylvania. Uh, that an example may be set up uh, to the nations that Pennsylvania should be the shining example of religious toleration, should be a shining example uh, of political uh, autonomy where we have assemblies and, and, and just courts, uh, and that the world should be looking to Pennsylvania, to this colony, uh, and, and think to themselves, can we do better? Can we make changes to ourselves? Um, that there may be room there, uh, though not here, for a holy experiment. Pennsylvania, uh, as it's often called, is William Penn's holy experiment. Let's give this a try. It didn't work in Great Britain. Let's invite, as I often say, all the religious whack jobs in Europe who are, are being persecuted uh, and bring them here and see what happens. Okay. Um, the end of the, the presentation here is a small um, timeline. In my mind, uh, chartering of Pennsylvania ends when William Penn begins to sell land in his colony. Okay, we could continue for another three hours on what happens to Pennsylvania under William Penn. Um, so this is, like I said, a relatively short timeline. April 8, 1681, uh, William Penn sends a letter to the inhabitants of Pennsylvania. Who are these inhabitants? Uh, there are already Dutch, there are already Swedes, there are already Finns here in the colony. There are also the Lenape, um, the descendants uh, who are now in Oklahoma, they were originally here, it's their land. So he's sending a letter to them um, saying, hey, <laughs> I'm coming um, and we're gonna try and get along and make all this work. Uh, so that's what that letter that was sent over. April 10th, uh, two days following, uh, he appoints William Markham his cousin, uh, you could say early nepotism, <laughs> uh, his cousin, uh, as Lieutenant Governor William Markham is gonna get on a ship and immediately come over. Uh, to, to Penn's colony. He's going to issue uh, letters of introduction to the Calvert family down in Maryland. He's gonna issue uh, letters of introduction to the governor in uh, New York, kind of saying this is where our colony is, okay? Uh, then throughout uh, 1680 uh, and into 1682, uh, he begins sending letters and pamphlets all over Europe. This is going to put William Penn in debt relatively early. He's writing letters in different languages, uh, pamphlets in different languages and saying, if you feel persecuted here, come to my colony. This colony is gonna be great. There's a lot of land here. You can build farms, you can build shops, you can uh, import, export here in Pennsylvania. It's gonna be great. Um, and, and writes some account of the providence of Pennsylvania, which is gonna tell uh, people in Europe what to expect when he gets to his colony. How much William Penn actually knows about his colony is sketchy, um, but it's, it's kind of a broadside. Let's send all these broadsides to get people excited about Pennsylvania. We do it today. Uh, he was doing it you know, 300 years ago. October uh, 28, 1683, um, Penn and other settlers um, land in what is Newcastle, Delaware. That is where Penn first makes landfall. Um, he is partial or full owner, I should say, of the uh, Delaware colony. Um, during the negotiations for Pennsylvania, William Penn complains that he doesn't have access um, to the Atlantic Ocean uh, because Pennsylvania would end um, if you just draw a straight line, it would end. Um, so he uh, convinces uh, James Duke of York to, to give him Maryland, which would give him access down to the, to the channel and out to the Atlantic Ocean. Um, so he lands there um, with the colonies on the, well, uh, other colonists, excuse me, with, uh, on the welcome. Uh, and it's at this point that he lays out the six original counties that will make up Pennsylvania and, and Delaware. So we have Chester County, Philadelphia County, Bucks County, Kent, Sussex, uh, and Newcastle. So those will be your colonies, uh, or counties, excuse me, that are set up uh, here in William Penn's new, new colony. Uh, and then from 1682 to 84, William Penn begins buying land from the Lenape. Um, buying or purchasing should be in quotations. Um, I often get asked, doesn't William Penn already own Pennsylvania? Didn't the king give it to him? Yes, but it is technically not the kings to give. There are people that are already here, uh, the Lenape being one of those large people that are already here. Um, and William Penn uh, sees what happens uh, or hears what happens to other colonies that don't get along with their indigenous people. Um, the king is still paying um, for New England um, Indian wars. Um, for King Philip's War up in Massachusetts. Um, William Penn knows what happens to the Jamestown settlement, to the Roanoke settlement. Uh, so he's not going to allow these kind of bad um, 
vibes to continue uh, in his colony. So he's going to purchase or barter for land um, here in Pennsylvania. And the relationship, as far as we can tell, is, is a fairly strong one uh, until William Penn's children's take over. William Penn's children, excuse me, take over. Uh, and then we get the walking purchase, which is going to begin that forced migration uh, of the Lenape from Pennsylvania, um, one of eight forced migrations that they will go under before they ending up in Oklahoma. But that is that is somewhat in the future. Um, but that is that is the end of my presentation because, as I said, um, in my mind, chartering Pennsylvania is done now. It becomes governing Pennsylvania uh, from '84 forward. Um, as I said, William Penn is going to have issues with with. Um, the Baltimore family, uh, the Calverts down in Maryland. Um, he's going to return to England several times. He's going to be in debtor's prison for a while. Um, life, life gets hairy for William Penn fairly quickly after getting, getting Pennsylvania. Um, and he believes that his holy experiment failed. Um, looking at it today, I don't believe William Penn's holy experiment failed at all. As I said, for the first time, all of these religious whack jobs, quote unquote, are forced to get along here. We don't have wars like we do in England. Um, the Anabaptists aren't being persecuted, you know, um, the Moravians, the Mennonites, the Brethren, they're really not being persecuted here. Um, the Quakers aren't being persecuted because they're the dominant culture. Um, the, the Lenape really aren't being persecuted uh, the way they were in other countries, um, colonies. So in my mind, it works. Um, whether William Penn saw it as a success or not, that the colony, I believe, the holy experiment did work. Uh, and what we have today, this kind of religious toleration, probably does stem from, from William Penn's experiment. Um, now, Maryland originally, uh, in their charter, had religious toleration. They walked that back, uh, and it did become kind of a Catholic enclave uh, a little bit later. Um, Rhode Island um, and some areas up in New England did have religious toleration, but I think that really kind of successful experiment was here in Pennsylvania. Um, again, I thank you very much for listening to me. I apologize for, for some of the tangents that I may have gone down on, for some of the walls of text that were on the slides, uh, and I'll, I'll open it up to any questions that you, that you have. Uh, there's a two-part series you just had from Ken Burns in uh, about Ben Franklin. Yes. And, uh, I'm not saying it is or was, but I understood Pennsylvania was a proud colony originally. It was charged by the king, right? But the order, you want to 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 um, so, um, West Jersey and, and, and Jersey itself was set up as, as kind of a, a, an original Quaker enclave. It was set up by, by Quaker businessmen and they were coming over and selling land. Um, so that is owned by a business. The charters that were set up, uh, for East and West Jersey were, were business charters, um, which were still restricted, um, by the monarchy, but were slightly more tolerated um, by Parliament and 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 Charles. Um, Pennsylvania um, originally was owned by by uh, James Duke of York, all of it. Um, and when William Penn gets that charter, he is kind of that first non-royal to to get that that land. Um, why does he get it as liberally as he does, as, as open as he does? Uh, my opinion is that his father laid a lot of that groundwork. Um, something I didn't mention in the slides, though, is that Parliament, upon the king's restoration, does forgive all debts incurred when the king is not sitting on the throne. So technically, the monarchy doesn't have to pay back any debt, doesn't have to give any credit to anybody. Um, but I do believe it was probably as just a nod to, to Admiral Penn's father that he got such a a big breath in in his charter. Yeah. Does that kind of answer the question? Well, it sounds like Franklin was trying to save the the uh, Civil War Revolution. Wanted to convert Pennsylvania so we were tolerated by the British. Um, so, so after William Penn passes away, um, 
William Penn's second wife, Hannah Penn, uh, runs the colony until her death then passes on to William Penn's heirs, the male heirs. Um, they don't do a phenomenally good job of listening um, to the assembly here in, in, in America, uh, in Pennsylvania. They do uh, spend very little time here. Um, and the, the assembly gets kind of fed up. The people here get fed up. So what William Penn is sent, or uh, excuse me, what Benjamin Franklin is sent over to do is to convince the king to revoke the Penn Charter and create a colony that is more attuned to a royal colony. Yeah. I neglected to mention, we don't have uh, uh, any way for the folks in the audience to make themselves heard uh, to our remote audience. So, you so I should answer, repeat, repeat, repeat the, the question, question as I answer it. Yeah. Yes. Please, okay. If we get any more. Anything else from the audience? The immediate audience, because I have some stuff. Do I see a hand? Yeah. Um, I love you, by the way. Thank you. Very great. There's a lot of history there, and it's amazing. Um, I just wanted to ask one question. Now, you said when William Penn decided he wanted to start the colonies here, it was in Pennsylvania, of course. Why would he have to have had a charter and eggs that came from England when England wouldn't have owned it if the turtles and the Indians had it already? Yes. Um, so. Yes, the, the Lenape, uh, the indigenous people in, in America, uh, have ancestral claim to the land in which the English are claiming ownership. Um, if we look at it solely from the English perspective, um, the colony of New York um, was a spoil of war. Uh, it was taken back from the Dutch during one of the Anglo-Dutch wars. It becomes the property of the monarchy. Uh, as one of those spoils of the war. Uh, so to get a colony, a royal colony, or, a, or a, a, a proprietary colony like William Penn once, he has to go to, to the king and, and request land. Um, so that, that's why he's doing it. Um, right of conquest, basically. In a lot of ways, yes. So, no, no, during the editing process, William Penn is in uh, fairly close proximity to everybody else. Um, I'm not saying they could walk down the street and hand the letter to them, um, but they would have sent pages, they would have sent um, members of the family, they would have sent members of staff with documents and, and moved them around. Or William Penn and people could travel to where the charters were being drafted. It, it, he would have taken carriages, they're not moving across oceans. Uh, they're just moving across land masses. It's all taking place in and around London. Hmm. Yeah. More. Did, did have you read William Admiral Penn's uh, uh, will? Will no, I have not. Do you have any information on whether it says that he had a claim? <laughs> against the king? Um, I don't believe that uh, Admiral Sir William Penn would have ever been so bold as to say he had uh, a credit with the monarchy. Um, this, this credit um, seems to grow and shrink uh, as is needed. Uh, originally, <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute, how's that happen? Originally, um, William Penn uh, writes in, in, when asking for the charter, says that there is a credit uh, of approximately 11,000 pounds. He, he makes that claim. He explicit. makes the claim, yes, looking at uh, cash books and receipt books that the Penn family kept uh, during the time the This uh, is the Penn better family. than the will speaking. Yeah. Good, uh, good. During the time that the Penn family was uh, funding uh, portions of the Navy, was giving food, was, was doing things for the monarchy, uh, they keep books, cash books, to understand where the money is going, credit books. Um, William Penn looks at these uh, and tabulates something uh, like 11,000 pounds worth of, of, of debt. Um, this will rise to 16,000 uh, pounds, which is what most people 
understand as the as the debt. Um, but as I said, it does kind of shrink, contract as as needed. As William Penn decides, he's going to make claims for for this colony. Still open to questions. We, we we're not getting anything in remotely, right? Uh, okay. Um, do you think of William Penn as a fabulous land developer? Do I think of William Penn as a fabulous land developer? I, I'll tell you what. In, in what respect? I think it seems to me the guy the guy had no money, essentially no money. He he yes. got he got he got a land grant over here from a king who didn't who who had a sort of barely recognizable claim on a whole lot of land. Mm -hmm. And he, he traded piece, bits and pieces, as I understand it, traded bits and pieces of that claim for actual tangible resources and turned it into a huge asset. Doesn't it look like that to you? Okay, so William Penn gets, what did I say, 40, 45,000 square miles of, of land. Land is an asset uh, to the English people. Um, a claim on land. A claim on land. Land, is, land belongs to those who control it. Yes, I would agree with that. Um, so he sells land. Um, we have a list of original purchasers. Um, you buy so many hundreds of acres, you get a front row plot, um, here in the beautiful city of Philadelphia. Um, you, you know, you have access, um, to a port city. Uh, if you come over here, you, you buy this land. So William Penn is, is convincing persecuted people. Um, to come over, uh, offer them religious toleration, offer them a new start here in the in the in the colony, um, for for money or goods or services. Uh, it's unclear if William Penn ever got the the money that was associated with the land that he was selling. He obviously was getting some of that money uh, because he was able to live off of off of Pennsylvania for a short period of time. Um, but how much in the way of taxes and how much in the way of actual money he's getting from selling this land is, is unclear. Um, in part of this, William Penn has a hard time collecting taxes uh, off of the land. Uh, quick rents is what we would call them. Um, and part of that is, is because of that southern border dispute. Where does that southern border begin? Um, who do you pay your taxes to if you're a Marylander? Who do you pay your taxes to if you're a Pennsylvanian? Um, something that I think was probably going on is uh, the Calvert family was saying, okay, you don't have to pay your taxes to William Penn because you're in Maryland. William Penn was probably saying, okay, you don't have to pay your quick rents or your taxes to, to Lord Baltimore, to the Calvert family, because you're in Pennsylvania. And I think probably what was happening is that uh, like good up and coming Americans, we don't pay our taxes to anybody. Um, so that is kind of what I think was happening. William Penn was struggling with with getting money and and always kind of did struggle with with getting money, running a business. and and the proprietorship of Pennsylvania was a business and and he struggled with that. Precisely my point. There's a hand in the back. Repeat. Um, so, uh, who, who is the tax money going to, or who is the quick rent money going to? Um, if you're in Maryland, uh, Maryland as a proprietary colony, you would be paying the Calvert family. 
um, or the Calvert representative. Um, in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania the proprietorship, William Penn is the proprietor, you're paying quick rents or taxes to the owner of the colony, so William Penn. Um, Delaware as a tax-free state, I, I don't know when Delaware became a tax-free state. I assume that is probably a modern um, addition to, to, to the people that live in Delaware. Um, Delaware was originally owned by William Penn, so any taxes or quick rents that were incurred in Delaware would have been paid to the, uh, the Penn family. Eventually, or eventually, excuse me, um, Delaware petitions the king to uh, become its own colony um, and separate itself from William Penn and his, his uh, Pennsylvania colony uh, because they don't feel that he is representing their interest best. Uh, so they separate off and become um, the colony of, of Delaware. Um, I was going to go somewhere with that too. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't mention Penn being thrown in jail for being a Quaker. Yes. How much time was that? And what do you think that Charles thought of it? So William Penn spent a great deal of time in prison as a Quaker. Um, after being um, accepted into the to the Society of Friends and to the Quakers. Uh, he is thrown in prison shortly after. Um, <clears throat> after his father passes away, uh, he is thrown into uh, prison again uh, for, for preaching Quaker values. Uh, we get the famous Penn Mead trial during this time, um, which is going to go down in history as kind of this um, change to judicial law uh, that William Penn will, will institute here in, in Pennsylvania. Um, he is thrown in jail in debtor's prison several times for being in debt. Um, but for good, being a Quaker specifically. For, yes. He was thrown, he was in, thrown in prison several times. This is the same Charles that, that gave, that, this Charles is what, is this his sheriff's? It would have been people that were, yes, in um, appointed by uh, Charles II. How much Charles II actually knew that William Penn was in prison, I, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, but Charles is probably not going to have any issue with a religious dissenter um, being thrown in prison. Um, if you think about it, uh, the official church of, of Great Britain, uh, the Anglican church, um, the head of that church is the monarch. Uh, if you have a problem with the established church, indirectly you have a problem with the monarch, uh, and that can be dangerous. Um, so I probably, I would think that he, he didn't have much of an issue uh, with William Penn being thrown in prison. Um, yeah, okay. We're, I'm, I am reminded that uh, we need to uh, keep it moving here. Yes. So, I am going to uh, nudge you away of from course. the camera just for a second. And thank you. And thank you. Thank you so much. Now, this is a man who stepped into this at the last minute and had to uh, gather his materials together at the last minute and showed up here to do us a favor. And I personally, who screwed it up, and so appreciative. We do this eight times a year. We are going to do it again the next three months, second Tuesday, 7.30. We broadcast on the two bands that we use, and uh, but you can get there by going to the, histo the historical society of frankfurt.org. We want to widen our reach, please tell your friends, please tune in again, and we'll see you, or you will see us at least, I hope again next month. Thanks.